Hey, Merry Christmas. It is uh, hard to believe that this is the last Sunday before Christmas. Has it caught, has it like caught you by surprise a little bit? I don't know how, how time's going for you, but it sure seems like uh, always that time is going by super fast. And here we are at the week of Christmas and the Sunday before Christmas. And I uh, um, want to say before I forget tonight, uh, reiterate what Pastor Austin said earlier and what you heard on the video announcements that tonight at our empty chair service, I think it will be a great time to bring hope and healing into any situation, whether the loss of your loved one was recent or decades ago. Um, but here's, here's our hope and our desire, and I don't know if we have communicated this clearly, but this, our hope is that this is an outreach event. So you've got neighbors, friends, family, coworkers that you know, uh, this could be a blessing to them, and it would bring hope into their lives, uh, just help to process through that. And so would you, would you take a moment uh, today, if you think of somebody, to give them a call, send them a text, invite them to come join you tonight. It will be a very special night of music, uh, spoken word, and uh, we're, we're um, praying and excited for that opportunity tonight. As I stop and think about the week, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? I look back over the week, we set all-time record highs across the state of Iowa on Wednesday. When I woke up on Wednesday and turned the news on, it was 5.30 on Wednesday morning and it was already 60 degrees. And uh, at that point, the weatherman said, we've already set the record high for today in history. Um, and, and, and he added this little caveat. He said, folks, when we're talking about record highs at, at this time of day in the middle of December, this is, not, this is gonna be a very eventful weather day. And uh, what, a, what an eventful day it was. We uh, endured another derecho type storm. We didn't know that uh, they even existed a year ago, but here, here we are with another uh, storm. I, I saw a graphic that said, uh, in the history since 1980 in Iowa, uh, from 1980 till now, we had four tornadoes recorded in December in Iowa. And Wednesday alone, we had 13, and possibly counting more. So. Very, very eventful day. Um, the warmest day on record in December in Iowa. And we canceled church. That's what we do. We get a 70 degree day in December and we cancel church. <laughs> who would have who thought? So it, I hope that you survived the storm. Anybody have any storm related uh, things happen maybe to, to you, your home, your, your property or whatever? I uh, woke up on Thursday morning and uh, saw uh, this at my house. My neighbor's tree, about 50, 60 foot tall uh, cottonwood tree that uh, didn't like the wind, and so it decided to lay down in my yard. <laughs> and uh, I, I've got other views I didn't show you, but it, it, it hit the side of my house with the top of the tree, so we've got some banged up gutters and a few holes in our vinyl siding and some soffits that's messed up. So, and a tree, uh, nonetheless, laying in my yard. Um, you, that, see that tree in the center, that stick kind of standing up? That's my tree in my property. <laughs> And that tree kind of fell right over the top of it and literally shaved the, the branches off both sides of the tree. So it's still laying in my yard. I haven't touched it yet. My neighbor says to my, my neighbor said to my wife, Jeannie, um, yeah, sorry about the tree, but we talked to our insurance person and that's your responsibility, not ours. <laughs> Which I already had talking to, talked to my insurance person who said, unfortunately, that's your responsibility and not theirs. And my thought was just wait a little while and see if they might just pull out some chainsaws and come over and take care of it for us, but I don't think that's gonna happen. So anyway, I got a tree in my yard and it's, uh, somebody told me uh, cottonwood is not the kind of tree to burn. So uh, someone told me this morning it's, it's, it's akin to gopher wood. I mean, as soon as you put wood on the fire, you go for more. So um, I, I, I would offer it to somebody for firewood, but I guess it's not, not any value that way. And I'm going to wait till a contractor shows up tomorrow and assesses the rest of the damage to decide what we're going to do with that big dog in my, in my yard. But uh, yeah, that's uh, happy, happy December, week before Christmas, we get, a, we get tornadoes and high winds and that's what happens. So, so today I'm talking about joy. <laughs> yes. I mean, you can't, you can't discern in my tone of my voice that like, like I'm super like 
joyful that I've got a 60 foot tree laying in my yard and uh, you know, what am I gonna do? I've got, you know, my, my insurance agent says, uh, yeah, the holes in your siding. When was the siding uh, put on? Well, it's about 16 years ago. Yeah, they may not make that anymore, which means probably a claim, big claim. So anyway, pray for our week. I, I would love for just to wake up and all that be gone and put back together, but it doesn't happen that way. Um, <laughs> but Chris, there was Christmas lights and it knocked some of them down, so yeah. <laughs> Hey, we took all the wreaths and everything that was, you know, loose around, and uh, we've got all that safe. It's just the tree in the backyard that decided to fall in, into my yard. So anyway, talking about joy, let's get there. We've, we continue in our series that we've been doing this month called uh, The Gift Exchange. And uh, so thankful for Jesus coming. The reason Jesus came was to give us life. He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. God became a man. The creator became part of his creation to save his people. The angel said to Joseph, Mary will have a son and you're to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save his creation. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. We know that there is an enemy. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy and knock trees over. And it's just, he... I'm not salty about this at all. <laughs> I'm done. No more trees. Good deal? You all okay with that? Yeah, get off the tree kick, Pastor Jeff. So in, in his coming, Jesus didn't um, only make a way for us. He restored a relationship with God, offering salvation, a, f a free gift from God, and he offers abundant life, and we're the recipients of so many blessings. God offers a, a divine exchange. He offers supernatural gladness for sadness. He offers light for darkness, real and genuine life for that which is counterfeit and fake. So thankful for what Jesus has done for us. And so we have talked about some of these blessings in the last couple of weeks. Pastor August started off with talking about peace and that Jesus exchanges peace for our worry, for our fear, and our anxiety. And last week, Pastor Austin talked about healing that he offers in exchange for our hurt and for our sickness and for our diseases and for our sin issues. And this morning, we're focusing on joy. And he offers joy in exchange for grief, for sorrow, and for sadness and mourning. You know, grief and sorrow are, are very, very real um, at Christmas. For some, the holidays are a reminder of, of the past, hurts from the past, unpleasant childhood memories, unrealized expectations, unresolved, uh, it can highlight an unresolved um, conflict with a, with a family member, the loss of a loved one represented by the, an empty chair at your table. And all of this going on in the midst of what we know and what we call a, a very joyous time, a joyful time, the most wonderful time of the year. This is a time when we celebrate the coming of Jesus, the light of the world. And so what do we do with our grief and with our sorrow in, the, in a season of joy that we call Christmas? How do we approach a holiday like Christmas? With, with that type of thing. And maybe, maybe loss is not something that you have experienced, but you know, as I'm preparing today with this topic, knowing that tonight we have our empty chair service and talking about grief and sorrow and, and the hope that Jesus brings, it, uh, I just started thinking about our lives and just thinking about what we have all been through the past two years. Um, we've gone through a very trying season, probably the most trying season of any of our lives. It's been very, very difficult. We've had to deal with a lot of sickness. We've dealt with death, challenges and changes in our lives and routines over the past several months like we've never experienced before. It's affected our families. It has affected our relationships with friends, with coworkers, with neighbors. We're coming to grips with the effects that uh, isolation has had on us, the effect that it has had on our, our, our younger children, some of our elderly uh, family members, um, 
sensing and recognizing some loss of our, of our freedoms over the last few months, the stress and anxiety that comes with thinking of uh, inflation uh, rising and how that affects our future, our financial stability. We're dealing with a lot of things, a lot of things that can cause us to be weary, to be physically tired and emotionally spent. And so we think about grief and sorrow being a loss of a person, but how many of you identify with the fact that as you look back over the last several months, the last couple of years, it really does feel like you're grieving a little bit, life like it used to be. How many conversations have we had where we say, well, we used to do it this way, or we used to have it like this, or even just um, hospitals. I mean, we've got people in the hospital that we can't go visit more than like one at a time. Our life, our life and our lifestyles have changed. Very, very difficult times. And so um, I think that we all are probably experiencing a little bit of grief and sorrow in those things. But let me just share with you a few scriptures that speak to this. The psalmist says in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. He also goes on to say, you've turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You've taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy. Isaiah said to all who mourn, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. And Jesus told his disciples, uh, John 16, before he, before he went to the cross, he said, you will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. You know, joy is mentioned in the Bible over 400 times. The word joy or rejoice or joyous in some form or fashion, the word joy appears over 400 times. And uh, as we talk about Christmas being a season of joy, joy isn't a season. Joy is a way of life. Joy isn't the absence of suffering and sorrow. Joy is the presence of God. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. We're talking about in the midst of our troubles, there is the presence of God. The angel announced the birth of Messiah to the shepherds who were out in the field. And the Bible tells us that when the angel spoke, they were terrified. But the angel reassured them. He said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which is for all people. Joy is something that we need. Joy is something that's available to us. The angel went on to say, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. You can read a totally different account of Jesus' birth and the time period shortly after that in Matthew chapter 2. And I won't go into a lot of details, but Herod finds out from the, the wise men that, you know, they're looking for this baby who was born king of the Jews. Herod was full of himself, and he was like, there, there can't be anybody taking my place. And so when the wise men tricked him and they didn't come back to him to tell him where Jesus was, he made a, a decree that every male baby, two years old and under, was to be killed. So I want you to think about that story. We often think about the angels speaking to the shepherds uh, uh, in a, uh, an incredible occasion, and they, they go and see the baby and realize it's everything that the angel told them that, that, that he would be. But here we have this account in Matthew, and of course an angel speaks to Joseph and Mary and says, leave and flee to Egypt. But think of what was left in Bethlehem. Children were dying. Mothers and fathers crying, utter chaos in Bethlehem, homes broken into, doors torn down, children ripped from their mother's arms, toddlers taken off the laps of their fathers, snatched away, soldiers killing, innocent children, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of grief, a lot of sorrow. But if Jesus is coming to earth as good news and great joy for all people, how are we experiencing joy? I think everybody wants joy. I've never met someone who said, my goal in life is to be as miserable as I possibly can. Do you? I know people who are that way, but I don't know if it's their goal to be as miserable as they possibly can. They're just miserable people. But we need joy, and now more than ever in the day that we live in, how many of you say, we need joy? I want you to think about your own life. Is your life one that you would characterize by saying, my life 
is an accurate representation of fullness of joy? Is your life full of joy? And you might be saying, well, sometimes I have joy and sometimes I don't, but I want to challenge a statement if you're thinking that way. You see, the world defines joy and happiness the same. You take time to look up a definition of joy and you're gonna get a whole, like a shotgun smattering of, of definitions for joy. And you look from a secular perspective of how they define joy and it is all about me. You help you, you be you, you and talk yourself up and t- tell yourself you're good and tell yourself you're worth it and tell yourself all these things. That's not joy. Joy and happiness. See, your happiness is based on happenings. It's based on your circumstances. Your happiness is determined by how your life is going. So if the kids are doing well, if the car isn't broke down, if the TV's working and things are cool with your boss, you're happy. And there's no tree laying in your yard. There you go. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks, Joyce. So what I want us to understand this morning is that joy and happiness are two different things. Two different words with two completely different meanings. Listen to this. Joy is internal. Happiness is external. Joy is a choice. Happiness is based on chance. Joy is in our heart. Happiness is on our face. Joy is of the soul, happiness is of the moment. Joy transcends, but happiness reacts. Joy is a practice and a behavior. It's deliberate and intentional and it stays. But happiness comes and goes casually as it will. Joy is a permanent possession while happiness is fleeting. Joy endures hardships and trials and connects with meaning and purpose. A person pursues happiness, but they choose joy. Joy is a choice. Joy is a a Christian word. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Those of you that know Galatians 5.22, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. It's, It's number two on the list. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's evidence of a Holy Spirit in our lives, exhibiting joy. If we're we're blood-bought Christian believers filled with the Holy Spirit, then we should be full of joy. And if you read through the scripture, listen, 400 times the word's used. Listen, we we should have joy. We should expect joy. But listen, joy isn't based on what happens to us. It's a choice that we make. The night before Jesus was crucified, he, he said these words in John chapter 15. I'm going to read a few verses uh, starting at verse 5. He said this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Listen, listen to how many times, I think it's eight times in these six verses, he uses the word remain. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. What kind of fruit is he looking for? The fruit of the Spirit. You remain in me, I remain in you. You're going to produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. I've got one of those piles. <laughs> I've got to let it, let it go. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you, Jesus said, as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love. When you obey my commands. Just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. How many of you are looking for joy? Overflow of joy. We found out that joy comes from a connection, a relationship, the presence of of God in our lives. 
It should be a natural outflow, an overflow, an overflow of joy coming from our lives because of our relationship, our connection with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Joy comes when Jesus is your personal Savior. The only place that you can experience real joy is in a relationship with Jesus. The world talks about joy, but it's, it's the same thing as happiness. It's just got a few weird, quirky, look it up sometime and read the definition of joy from a secular perspective. Listen, I believe that the only joy that we truly, real joy, comes from God in a relationship with him. I can tell you that personally in my own devotional life, I experience more joy when that devotional life is healthy. But when I get too consumed with other things, like worries, the cares of life, TV, news, social media, I begin to feel empty. Listen, Fox News, CNN, not going to fill you with joy. Promise. Social media, scrolling around on social media, not going to fill you with joy. Said no one. No one said that. But we all understand what we're talking about. We're made for a relationship with God. So I've got a little bit of an illustration that I want to I wanna share with you here. And um, this is just take a little bit of a setup here for me. But I want you to notice this right here. This right here. This is like my magic trick, but it's not. <laughs> Diet Dr. Pepper. The best soda ever. How many of you agree with me? How many Diet Dr. Pepper people out there? How about regular Dr. Pepper? Okay, look at us. Look at us. We're a team, guys. This cup right here is a styrofoam cup. Styrofoam is a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's kind of weak, but styrofoam will last. You can use styrofoam. This is, this is a little bit of coffee. I'm usually not a Starbucks drinker. Actually, I'm not going to drink that today. I drank that in the last service. I left a funky taste in my mouth. <laughs> I do love coffee, and we put coffee in these, these cups. And it's amazing that you can go back and refill and refill, and it does a good job. And I could hold it out till later in the day when I'm, when I'm pulling out the Dr. Pepper. And so I, uh, I told the first service that this is, uh, this is one, of my, one of my joys in life is drinking, drinking soda, and diet Dr. Pepper is the best. And, um, but I'm going to go on a diet the first of the year. This is my accountability to all of you. And most likely, I'm going to have to give up soda. Who said yes? Don't agree, don't agree so quickly with me, Lord. But here's the deal. I'm drinking Dr. Pepper right here in front of you today. And everybody joining online. Dr. Pepper. And you know what I can do? When I'm on a diet and I'm not drinking Dr. Pepper, I can go back and watch this, this live stream and watch myself drinking Dr. Pepper. And I think that could be therapeutic. Just, just saying. But this cup is, it's, it, it's good to hold a lot of good things. But how many of you know, just like our life, we can put a lot of good things in, but there's some things that we can put in that are not so good. This is uh, acetone. You can drink a little bit of it and you'll be okay. Well... Nobody told me that, I'm just guessing. <laughs> but this, this cup that held my Dr. Pepper that I could drink coffee out of and repeat, repeat, I put a little bit of, little bit of acetone. You know, this is the stuff that takes fingernail polish off. Up. Oh my goodness. Um, that's not good. I'm changing my mind, do not drink acetone. <laughs> but isn't it amazing just how like something that might look okay, a little bit of something like that can cause holes in something otherwise that can hold good things. There's a quote from Billy Sunday, and he said, if there's, there, if there's no joy in your religion, then there is a, a leaky vessel. If there's no joy in your religion, there's a leaky vessel, a leak in your Christianity somewhere. And I want us just to think about that a little bit. If we don't have joy and we're not overflowing with joy in our lives, maybe we have some leaks. 
And it could be that something that we've put into our life is causing holes for the joy to leak out. Joy comes from a relationship with the Lord. And in the Bible, it talks so much about joy. I believe that we, God wants us, his people, to be joyful people. A book of Acts, um, which we're studying on Wednesday night, you often read about believers who were full of the Holy Spirit, and it says that they were full of joy. The secret to their joy is perspective. Because see, here's the deal. Even though Christians ought to be the most joyful people in the world, we should be because, because we have hope. We've got perspective. In the midst of trials, in the midst of troubles, we have a perspective, and we're going to look at some scripture, but when we have that perspective, a God perspective, we're able to step back and, and, and see it completely different. I want to explain to you um, just an example of joy. I'm looking out seeing Donna Markle and her family. A week ago today, Frank passed away and went to heaven, and we had his service here Friday, Friday morning. And this is, a, this is a picture of joy. I'm standing here on the platform, and here's the family sitting right here, and I look out and see Donna and her kids, and what do I see is tears running down their face with a smile. That's a picture of joy. That my circumstances, that I, uh, I lost the man that I was married to for 65 years, and he's no longer with me, and while this is a sad moment, we have, we have hope. We live with hope that this world isn't all that there is. Listen, I am not afraid to die. I hope that you're not. I hope that you don't spend any time worrying, fearing about your life ending here on this earth because I got news for you. None of us are making that out of here alive unless Jesus comes back, which I hope he does and I think he will soon. But this is the deal. It's gonna be our time at some point. And listen, if, you, if you're struggling with that, then we need to help you pray through that. Because as a follower of Jesus, as someone who has put their faith and their hope in him, we've got a bigger picture perspective. This world is just temporary. We're just here for a little while. There is an eternity that waits us, and we're going to be one by one, our family gathering on the other side, and there's going to be a big reunion, and it's going to be a big celebration. And how could we be sad about that? We're sad because we have someone missing in our, in our, in our home, in our life. But listen, we live with that hope that this isn't forever. I hope that you're not sad about dying because dying, Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is great gain. It's a win-win deal either way. And I'm not, diminishing, I'm not diminishing death and loss. I'm just saying, look, we have to have that perspective, a big picture perspective. Because here's the deal. Um, when we have the right God perspective, we have joy in the midst of our circumstances. When we have the wrong perspective, we can be robbed of joy. I want to turn to Romans chapter 5. And I got I to gotta go quickly here because I've spent too much time talking about trees not salty. Romans chapter 5, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. We hear a lot about privilege these days. This is, uh, we, we are people of privilege. We, didn't des we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We just have this privilege that God has given us because of what he's done for us. Uh, we, are, we, we live in this place of undeserved privilege where now we stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Listen, do you, have you ever struggled with that? Rejoice and have joy when you run into troubles and, and trials. Any of you have joy about that? This is big picture perspective. We've got to step back and look at the big picture. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. He's saying, look, there's a confidence. There's a knowing in our heart that what we're going through, God is with us. God is for us. God is in us. God loves us and he's working things together for our good. These are all promises that we know from Scripture. So he's, he's, he's appealing to what we know in our hearts. Listen, we know this, okay? Trials, troubles, we're facing difficulties. We got this. 
Because God's got us. And what we're facing, we can have joy because we know that he's going to use it for us. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. James says something very similar. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider it all Consider it pure joy. Count it all joy. He uses those words in different translations, but this is it. It's joy when you face trials of many kinds. For you know, listen, he's going back to what we should know. You know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing, not lacking anything. He's going to give you everything that you need to make it through this. And you're going to come through the other side stronger. You're going to come through more equipped. You're going to come through being able to endure. You're going to be more mature. You're going to be more complete. How many of you are for that? So when we face trials, when we go through times like we've been through in the last few months, we can look at that with a positive attitude and say, for joy I'm facing this. For joy, I'm going through this. I'm not complaining about my neighbor. I'm not complaining about the, the, the person who did me wrong or whatever it might be who had this argument with me about whatever crazy thing we have arguments about these days. Listen, let's stay focused on the right thing. Let's have a big picture perspective, a God perspective on our life and our troubles. We need to understand the truths of scriptures. You can have joy in the midst of difficulties, financial difficulty. Physical difficulty, your job difficulty, some relational difficulty. You can have joy going through very dark, deep times in your life. It's true because God has a purpose for your life. And he's working all things together for good. That's what he says in Romans 8, just three chapters later. We know that in all things, we know. We know in all things he's working things for good in our lives. Listen to this. I ask you this question. If you absolutely knew that God was in complete and total control of your life. And if you absolutely knew that everything that happened to you had a purpose, and if you knew that because you're a child of God, he will use whatever is happening to you, whether it's positive, negative, whether it's good or bad, for your spiritual development and growth, for the bettering of your life and for the advancement of his kingdom, would that bring joy? That's your reality. He's all those things. If we lived with that kind of joy, it would completely confound the world. Have you ever had anybody look at you and just go, what is wrong with you? Why do you have a smile on your face? Why don't you seem to be yelling at people? What is it with you? Wouldn't that be the greatest compliment somebody could give us? Listen, we can't fake that. I don't, I don't know about you, but I can't. I can't fake that kind of stuff. It has to be real. But I believe that God is real and he can do those real things in our lives. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't and won't have problems. The fact is, Christians have as many problems as non-Christian people do. Giving your life to God isn't gonna make the problems go away. The difference is not in the amount of problems, but the perspective of those problems. We know that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Listen, we should not ever doubt the plans of God. He's not making mistakes. He can't do that. I want to give you just a, a, a list real quickly. I'm not going to spend any time because we're going we're to close this. But just as much as we can and should have joy in our lives because we're Christians, There are a lot of things that rob us of joy. We know that Satan is out to do all that he can to rob from you the things that God has put in your life. Just as much as Jesus has come that we have life and have it to the full, Satan's come to steal, kill, and destroy everything that you have. Anything that God wants to do in your life, he will do whatever he can, use whatever means he can to do whatever he can to get you to doubt God, to get you to not have joy to get you to lose the perspective and get it right on the here and now. That's what he does. 
Here's some, here's some things that rob our joy, circumstances. Our circumstances can easily rob us of our joy, but they can bring glory to God. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians. Philippians is a book on joy. Take time this week to read through Philippians. Four chapters, it's simple. In chapter one, he says this in verse 12. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped me to spread the good news. Where's Paul at? He's in jail. He's saying, I want you guys to know that everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. He's going, look, all good. He could have thrown in the towel and said, look, if God's going to let me just sit in prison, what's, what, what, what's the good of being a Christian? You ever thought things like that? Yeah, I'm a Christian, but where's God? Why does he let this happen? Why do I find myself doing this? Circumstances? Satan can use to rob people. People can bring you to a a place of great joy, but people can rob you of your joy. In chapter two, he says this in verse two, make me truly happy. In the NIV, he says, make my joy complete by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's the way we need to relate to others. And look, if somebody's being negative to you, just love them. You can love them with the love of of Jesus because if you're remaining in him and in his love, guess what? He remains in you and he's filled you with love. He's filled you with his spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all the things that you need to love people through his Holy Spirit. Things can rob you of your joy. If you're looking for joy in things and you found this out by now, you're, you're going down a dead end road. Material possessions will not bring you joy. But Paul said this, chapter three, verse seven. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. In chapter four, he says worry. And worry is one of those things that will rob you of joy. But this is what he says in Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry. Easy to say. But he gives you the antidote. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. When Satan wants to try to get you to focus on your problems and worry, that's the time when you say, oh, this is, this is my cue to give it to God. Cast my cares on him because he cares for me. Here's the last thing that will rob you, and that's sin. Now I'll go back to, to this right here. You know what happens, the holes that we experience in our life? Sin. We're holding things that we were never intended to hold. And it has an effect on us that God knows would never, never be okay. Never be acceptable. Sin brings sadness. Holiness brings gladness. It's the Holy Spirit. He's holy and he wants us to be holy. Moms and dads, you need to tell your kids this over and over. What Satan in the world propagates is that sin, do whatever, do whatever feels good, do whatever, whatever feels right. Listen, sin will always bring sadness and sorrow. Holiness will always bring gladness. The Bible tells us that there's pleasure in sin but only for a short season. The wages of sin is death. That's the long-term effect. Listen, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes. I don't know where you're at today. Assessing and evaluating your joy. Some of you might be here today just feeling like you're leaking all over. There's holes.
want to be full of joy. God is amazing in what he can do to restore and heal, to patch up, to clean up, to rework, to where your life is better than what it was before. He's amazing. It just takes a relationship with him. Today, if you're in the room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've experienced the effects of sin and what sin can do to your life and sin can cause all kinds of sorrow and sadness, sickness, can cause you to grieve. You think, you think there's joy in hanging out with your friends and doing whatever they're doing, but you realize day after day, and this didn't do what I thought it would. Today you need joy with every head bowed and eye closed and you're saying, Pastor Jeff, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but today I want to make him Lord of my life. I want to be full of that kind of joy. I want to have those types. I want to know that not only that God's with me, but he's going to help me, that he's for me. He's working things in my life for good. That He'll take my sin and remove it from me as far as the east is from the west, and it's free. It doesn't cost me anything other than my life. If that's you today and you're empty, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and today you're responding saying, that's me. Would you just raise a hand across the room? Raise your hand and keep it raised. If you're joining online and you're responding today, I want to lead all of us in a prayer. And if you want to respond in that way, would you pray this prayer with me, Jesus? We thank you that you have made a way for us. Thank you that you came, Emmanuel, God with us, that you came bringing great joy for all people. I want that joy. And I ask you to come into my life, forgive my sin, change me, make me into who you want me to be. I look to you, I lean on you, I put my trust in you. Lord, have your way in me. Save me and forgive me. Change my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to know today for everyone that's still, that you're, you're, you're sitting here today and you're going, you know what, I, I just feel like my life is a little bit leaky and I feel like I'm not, I don't have the joy that I want. And you would just stand today and say, I, I want all the joy that God can give me and I feel like my life is just missing something. If you're just in the room, just stand where you're at. This is okay to say, I want joy. This is a good thing. Like if I had a coupon for $1,000 off of something and I said, whoever wants this $1,000 for you know, a new TV, how many of you would take that? That's, that's pretty cool. It's free. Just one joy. I need more joy. I want Jesus to stop up the holes so I stop leaking so that I can be overflowing with joy. Father, in this place so that you would fill us with your joy. We need you. We need joy. We need a, your presence with us always. We need a relationship with you. We want you more than anything. And so God, I pray that you'd fill us with the fullness of your joy, with your presence, with your peace, with your purpose, with your plans, that we would walk in the way that you want us to walk, that we'd be full of all that you have for us. We need your joy in Jesus' name. Amen.